We shall, we shall begin. The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. Chapter One, There Is No One Left. When Mary Lennox was sent to Misselthwaite Manor to live with her uncle, everybody said she was the most disagreeable looking child ever seen. It was true too. She had a thin little face and a little thin body, thin light hair and a sour expression. Her hair was yellow and her face was yellow because she had been born in India and had always been ill in one way or another. Her father had held a position under the English government and had always been busy and ill himself. And her mother had been a great beauty who cared only to go to parties and amuse herself with gay people. She had not wanted a little girl at all. And when Mary was born, she handed her over to the care of an ayah, who was made to understand that if she wished to please the Memsaib, she must keep the child out of sight as much as possible. So when she was a sickly, fretful, ugly little baby, she was kept out of the way. And when she became a sickly, fretful, toddling thing, she was kept out of the way also. She never remembered seeing familiarly anything but the dark faces of her ayah and the other native servants, and as they always obeyed her and gave her her own way in everything, because the Mem Saib would be angry if she was disturbed by her crying, by the time she was six years old, she was as tyrannical and selfish a little pig as ever lived. The young English governess who came to teach her to read and write disliked her so much that she gave up her place in three months, and when other governesses came to try to fill it, they always went away in a shorter time than the first one. So if Mary had not chosen really to want to know how to read books, she would never have learned her letters at all. One frightfully hot morning, when she was about nine years old, she awakened feeling very cross, and she became crosser still when she saw that the servant who stood by her bedside was not her ayah. Why did you come? she said to the strange woman. I will not let you stay. Send my ayah to me. The woman looked frightened, but she only stammered that the ayah could not come. And when Mary threw herself into a passion and beat and kicked her, she looked only more frightened and repeated that it was not possible for the ayah to come to Missy Sahib. There was something mysterious in the air that morning. Nothing was done in its regular order, and several of the native servants seemed missing, while those whom Mary saw slunk or hurried about with ashy and scared faces but no one would tell her anything, and her ayah did not come. She was actually left alone as the morning went on, and at last wandered out into the garden and began to play by herself under a tree near the veranda. She pretended that she was making a flower bed, and she stuck big scarlet hibiscus blossoms into little heaps of earth, all the time growing more and more angry and muttering to herself the things she would say and the names she would call Sadie when she returned. Pig! Pig! Daughter of pigs! she said, because to call a native a pig is the worst insult of all. She was grinding her teeth and saying this over and over again when she heard her mother come out on the veranda with someone. She was with a fair young man, and they stood talking together in low, strange voices. Mary knew the fair young man who looked like a boy. She had heard that he was a very young officer who had just come from England. The child stared at him, but she stared most at her mother. She always did this when she had a chance to see her, because the Mem Sahib, Mary used to call her that oftener than anything else, was such a tall, slim, pretty person, and she wore such lovely clothes. Her hair was like curly silk, and she had a delicate little nose which seemed to be, excuse me, which seemed to be disdaining things, and she had large, laughing eyes. All her clothes were thin and floating, and Mary said they were full of lace. They looked fuller of lace than ever this morning, but her eyes were not laughing at all. They were large and scared, 
and lifted imploringly to the fair boy officer's face. Is it so very bad? Oh, is it? Mary heard her say. Awfully, the young man answered in a trembling voice. Awfully, Mrs Lennox. You ought to have gone to the hills two weeks ago. The Mem Sahib wrung her hands. Oh, I know I ought, she cried. I only stayed to go to that silly dinner party. What a fool I was. At that very moment, such a loud sound of wailing broke out from the servants' quarters that she clutched the young man's arm, and Mary stood shivering from head to foot. The wailing grew wilder and wilder. What is it? What is it? Mrs Lennox gasped. Someone has died, answered the boy officer. You did not say that it had broken out among your servants. I did not know, the Mem Sahib cried. Come with me, come with me. And she turned and ran into the house. After that, appalling things happened, and the mysteriousness of the morning was explained to Mary. The cholera had broken out in its most fatal form, and people were dying like flies. The ayah had been taken ill in the night, and it was because she had just died that the servants had wailed in the huts. Before the next day, three other servants were dead, and others had run away in terror. There was panic on every side, and dying people in all the bungalows. During the confusion and bewilderment of the second day, Mary hid herself in the nursery and was forgotten by everyone. Nobody thought of her, nobody wanted her, and strange things happened of which she knew nothing. Mary alternately cried and slept through the hours. She only knew that people were ill and that she heard mysterious and frightening sounds. Once she crept into the dining room and found it empty, though a partly finished meal was on the table and chairs and plates looked as if they had been hastily pushed back when the diners rose suddenly for some reason. The child ate some fruit and biscuits, and being thirsty she drank a glass of wine which stood nearly filled. It was sweet, and she did not know how strong it was. Very soon it made her intensely drowsy, and she went back to her nursery and shut herself in again, frightened by cries she heard in the huts and by the hurrying sound of feet. The wine made her so sleepy that she, should, she could scarcely keep her eyes open, and she lay down on her bed and knew nothing more for a long time. Many things happened during the hours in which she slept so heavily, but she was not disturbed by the wails and the sound of things being carried in and out of the bungalow. When she awakened, she lay and stared at the wall. The house was perfectly still. She had never known it to be so silent before. She heard neither voices nor footsteps, and wondered if everybody had got well of the cholera and all the trouble was over. She wondered also who would take care of her now her ayah was dead. There would be a new ayah, and perhaps she would know some new stories. Mary had been rather tired of the old ones. She did not cry because her nurse had died. She was not an affectionate child and had never cared much for anyone. The noise and hurrying about and wailing over the cholera had frightened her, and she had been angry because no one seemed to remember that she was alive. Everyone was too panic-stricken to think of a little girl no one was fond of. When people had the cholera, it seemed that they remembered nothing but themselves. But if everyone had got well again, surely someone would remember and come to look for her. But no one came, and as she lay waiting, the house seemed to grow more and more silent. She heard something rustling on the matting, and when she looked down she saw a little snake gliding along and watching her with eyes like jewels. She was not frightened, because he was a harmless little thing who would not hurt her, and he seemed in a hurry to get out of the room. He slipped under the door as she watched him. "'How queer and quiet it is,' she said. 
It sounds as if there was no one in the bungalow but me and the snake. Almost the next minute, she heard footsteps in the compound and then on the veranda. They were men's footsteps and the men entered the bungalow and talked in low voices. No one went to meet or speak to them and they seemed to open doors and look into rooms. What desolation, she heard one voice say. That pretty, pretty woman. I suppose the child too. I heard there was a child, though no one ever saw her. Mary was standing in the middle of the nursery when they opened the door a few minutes later. She looked an ugly, cross little thing and was frowning because she was beginning to be hungry and feel disgracefully neglected. The first man who came in was a large officer she had once seen talking to her father. He looked tired and troubled, but when he saw her he was so startled that he almost jumped back. Barney! he cried out. There is a child here, a child alone. In a place like this? Mercy on us! Who is she? I am Mary Lennox, the little girl said, drawing herself up stiffly. She thought the man was very rude to call her father's bungalow a place like this. I fell asleep when everyone had the cholera and I have only just wakened up. Why does nobody come? It is the child no one ever saw, exclaimed the man, turning to his companions. She has actually been forgotten. Why was I forgotten? Mary said, stamping her foot. Why does nobody come? The young man, whose name was Barney, looked at her very sadly. Mary even thought she saw him wink his eyes as if to wink tears away. Poor little kid, he said. There is nobody left to come. It was in that strange and sudden way that Mary found out that she had neither father nor mother left, that they had died and been carried away in the night, and that the few native servants who had not died also had left the house as quickly as they could get out of it, none of them even remembering that there was a Missy Sahib. That was why the place was so quiet. It was true that there was no one in the bungalow but herself and the little rustling snake. Chapter 2 Mistress Mary Quite Contrary Mary had liked to look at her mother from a distance and she had thought her very pretty, but as she knew very little of her, she could scarcely have been expected to love her or to miss her very much when she was gone. She did not miss her at all, in fact, and as she was a self-absorbed child, she gave her entire thought to herself, as she had always done. If she had been older, she would no doubt have been very anxious at being left alone in the world, but she was very young, and as she had always been taken care of, she supposed she always would be. What she thought was that she would like to know if she was going to nice people who would be polite to her and give her her own way as her ayah and the other native servants had done. She knew that she was not going to stay at the English clergyman's house where she was taken at first. She did not want to stay. The English clergyman was poor and he had five children all nearly the same age and they wore shabby clothes and were always quarrelling and snatching toys from each other. Mary hated their untidy bungalow and was so disagreeable to them that after the first day or two nobody would play with her. By the second day they had given her a nickname which made her furious. It was Basil who thought of it first. Basil was a little boy with impudent blue eyes and a turned up nose and Mary hated him. She was playing by herself under a tree just as she had been playing the day the cholera broke out. She was making heaps of earth and paths for a garden, and Basil came and stood near to watch her. Presently he got rather interested, and suddenly made a suggestion. "'Why don't you put a heap of stones there and pretend it is a rockery?' he said. "'There in the middle.' And he leaned over her to point. "'Go away!' cried Mary. "'I don't want boys. Go away!' 
For a moment, Basil looked angry, and then he began to tease. He was always teasing his sisters. He danced round and round her, and made faces, and sang and laughed. Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow, with silver bells and cockle shells and marigolds all in a row? He sang it until the other children heard and laughed too, and the crosser Mary got, the more they sang Mistress Mary quite contrary, and after that, as long as she stayed with them, they called her Mistress Mary quite contrary, and when they spoke of her to each other, and often when they spoke to her. "'You're going to be sent home,' Basil said to her, "'at the end of the week, and we're glad of it.' "'I am glad of it too.' answered Mary. Where is home? She doesn't know where home is, said Basil, with seven-year-old scorn. It's England, of course. Our grandmamma lives there, and our sister Mabel was sent to her last year. You are not going to your grandmamma. You have none. You are going to your uncle. His name is Mr Archibald Craven. I don't know anything about him, snapped Mary. I know you don't. Basil answered. You don't know anything. Girls never do. I heard father and mother talking about him. He lives in a great, big, desolate old house in the country, and no one goes near him. He's so cross he won't let them, and they wouldn't come if he would let them. He's a hunchback, and he's horrid. I don't believe you, said Mary, and she turned her back and stuck her fingers in her ears, because she would not listen any more. But she thought over it a great deal afterward, and when Mrs Crawford told her that night that she was going to sail away to England in a few days and going to her uncle, Mr Archibald Craven, who lived at Misselthwaite Manor, she looked so stony and stubbornly uninterested that they did not know what to think about her. They tried to be kind to her, but she only turned her face away when Mrs Crawford attempted to kiss her and held herself sti stiffly when Mr Crawford patted her shoulder. "'She is such a plain child,' Mrs Crawford said pityingly afterward, "'and her mother was such a pretty creature. "'She had a very pretty manner, too, "'and Mary has the most unattractive ways I ever saw in a child. "'The children call her Mistress Mary Quite Contrary, "'and though it's naughty of them, one can't help understanding it.' Perhaps, if her mother had carried her pretty face and her pretty manners oftener into the nursery, Mary might have learnt some pretty ways too. It is very sad now the poor beautiful thing is gone to remember that many people never even knew that she had a child at all. I believe she scarcely ever looked at her, sighed Mrs Crawford. When her ayah was dead there was no one to give a thought to the little thing. Think of the servants running away and leaving her all alone in that deserted bungalow. Colonel McGrew said he nearly jumped out of his skin when he opened the door and found her standing by herself in the middle of the room. Mary made the long voyage to England under the care of an officer's wife, who was taking her children to leave them in a boarding school. She was very much absorbed in her own little boy and girl, and was rather glad to hand the child over to the woman Mr Archibald Craven sent to meet her in London. The woman was his housekeeper at Misselthwaite Manor, and her name was Mrs Medlock. She was a stout woman, with very red cheeks and sharp black eyes. She wore a very purple dress, a black silk mantle with jet fringes on it, and a black bonnet with purple velvet flowers which stuck up and trembled when she moved her head. Mary did not like her at all, but as she very seldom liked people, there was nothing remarkable in that. Besides which, it was very evident Mrs Medlock did not think much of her. "'My word, she's a plain little piece of goods,' she said, and we'd heard that her mother was a beauty. She hasn't handed much of it down, has she, ma'am?' "'Perhaps she will improve as she grows older,' the officer's wife said good-naturedly. If she were not so sallow and had a nicer expression, her features are rather good. Children alter so much. She'll have to alter a good deal, answered Mrs Medlock. Then there's nothing likely to improve children at Misselthwaite, if you ask me. 
They thought Mary was not listening because she was standing a little apart from them at the window of the private hotel they had gone to. She was watching the passing buses and cabs and people, but she heard quite well and was made very curious about her uncle and the place he lived in. What sort of a place was it and what would he be like? What was a hunchback? She had never seen one. Perhaps there were none in India. Since she had been living in other people's houses and had had no ayah, she had begun to feel lonely and to think queer thoughts which were new to her. She had begun to wonder why she had never seemed to belong to anyone, even when her father and mother had been alive. Other children seemed to belong to their fathers and mothers, but she had never seemed to really be anyone's little girl. She had had servants and food and clothes, but no one had taken any notice of her. She did not know that this was because she was a disagreeable child, but then, of course, she did not know she was disagreeable. She often thought that other people were, but she did not know that she was so herself. She thought Mrs. Medlock the most disagreeable person she had ever seen, with her common, highly coloured face and her common, fine bonnet. When the next day they set out on their journey to Yorkshire, she walked through the station to the railway carriage with her head up and trying to keep as far away from her as she could, because she did not want to seem to belong to her. It would have made her very angry to think people imagined she was her little girl. But Mrs. Medlock was not in the least disturbed by her and her thoughts. She was the kind of woman who would stand no nonsense from young ones. At least, that is what she would have said if she had been asked. She had not wanted to go to London just when her sister Maria's daughter was going to be married, but she had a comfortable, well-played place as housekeeper at Misselthwaite Manor, and the only way in which she could keep it was to do at once what Mr. Archibald Craven told her to do. She never dared even to ask a question. Captain Lennox and his wife died of the cholera, Mr Craven had said in his short, cold way. Captain Lennox was my wife's brother, and I am their daughter's guardian. The child is to be brought here. You must go to London and bring her yourself. So she packed her small trunk and made the journey. Mary sat in her corner of the railway carriage and looked plain and fretful. She had nothing to read or to look at, and she had folded her little thin black-gloved hands in her lap. Her black dress made her look yellower than ever, and her limp light hair straggled from under her black crepe hat. A more marred-looking one I never saw in my life, Mrs Medlock thought. Marred is a Yorkshire word and means spoiled and pettish. She had never seen a child who sat so still without doing anything, and at last she got tired of watching her and began to talk in a brisk, hard voice. I suppose I may as well tell you something about where you are going to, she said. Do you know anything about your uncle? No, said Mary. Never heard your father and mother talk about him? No, said Mary, frowning. She frowned because she remembered that her father and mother had never talked to her about anything. In, so, excuse me, anything in particular. Certainly they had never told her things. Humph, muttered Mrs. Medlock, staring at her queer, unresponsive little face. She did not say any more for a few moments, and then she began again. I suppose you might as well be told something to prepare you. You are going to a queer place. Mary said nothing at all, and Mrs. Medlock looked rather discomfited by her apparent indifference, but after taking a breath, she went on. Not but that it's a grand big place in a gloomy way, and Mr. Craven's proud of it in his way, and that's gloomy enough too. The house is six hundred years old, and it's on the edge of the moor, and there's near a hundred rooms in it, though most of them's shut up and locked. And there's pictures and fine old furniture and things that's been there for ages. And there's a big park round it and gardens and trees with branches trailing to the ground. Some of them. She paused and took another breath. 
but there's nothing else, she ended suddenly. Mary had begun to listen in spite of herself. It all sounded so unlike India, and anything new rather attracted her. But she did not intend to look as if she were interested. That was one of her unhappy, disagreeable ways. So she sat still. Well, said Mrs Medlock, what do you think of it? Nothing, she answered. I know nothing about such places. That made Mrs Medlock laugh, a short kind of laugh. Eh? she said. But you are like an old woman. Don't you care? It doesn't matter, said Mary, whether I care or not. You are right enough there, said Mrs Medlock. It doesn't. What you're to be kept at Misselthwaite Manor for, I don't know, unless it's because it's the easiest way. He's not going to trouble himself about you, that's sure and certain. He never troubles himself about no one. She stopped herself as if she had just remembered something in time. He's got a crooked back, she said. That set him wrong. He was a sour young man and got no good of all his money in big place till he was married. Mary's eyes turned towards her, in spite of her intention not to seem to care. She had never thought of the hunchbacks being married, and she was a trifle surprised. Mrs Medlock saw this, and as she was a talkative woman, she continued with more interest. This was one way of passing some of the time, at any rate. She was a sweet, pretty thing, and he'd have walked the world over to get her a blade of grass she wanted. Nobody thought she'd marry him, but she did, and people said she married him for his money. But she didn't. She didn't. Positively. When she died, Mary gave a little involuntary jump. Oh, did she die? She exclaimed, quite without meaning to. She had just remembered a French fairy story she had once read called Riquet à la Houpe. It had been about a poor hunchback and a beautiful princess, and it had made her suddenly sorry for Mr Archibald Craven. Yes, she died, Mrs Medlock answered, and it made him queerer than ever. He cares about nobody. He won't see people. Most of the time he goes away, and when he is at Misselthwaite he shuts himself up in the West Wing and won't let anyone but Pitcher see him. Pitcher's an old fellow, but he took care of him when he was a child, and he knows his ways. It sounded like something in a book, and it did not make Mary feel cheerful. A house with a hundred rooms, nearly all shut up and with their doors locked. A house on the edge of a moor, whatsoever a moor was, sounded dreary. A man with a crooked back who shut himself up also... She stared out of the window with her lips pinched together, and it seemed quite natural that the rain should have begun to pour down in grey slanting lines and splash and stream down the window panes. If the pretty wife had been alive, she might have made things cheerful by being something like her own mother, and by running in and out and going to parties as she had done in frocks full of lace. But she was not there any more. You needn't expect to see him, because ten to one you won't said Mrs Medlock, and you mustn't expect that there will be people to talk to you. You'll have to play about and look after yourself. You'll be told what rooms you can go into and what rooms you're to keep out of. There's gardens enough, but when you're in the house don't go wandering and poking about. Mr Craven won't have it. I shall not want to go poking about, said sour little Mary, and just as suddenly as she had begun to be rather sorry for Mr Archibald Craven, she began to cease to be sorry, and to think he was unpleasant enough to deserve all that had happened to him. And she turned her face towards the streaming panes of the window of the railway carriage, and gazed out at the grey rainstorm, which looked as if it would go on for ever and ever. She watched it so long and steadily that the greyness grew heavier and heavier before her eyes, and she fell asleep. Chapter 3 Across the Moor She slept a long time, and when she awakened, Mrs Medlock had brought a lunch basket at one of the stations, and they had some chicken and cold beef and bread and butter and some hot tea. The rain seemed to be streaming down more heavily than ever, and everybody in the station wore wet and glistening waterproofs. 
The guard lighted the lamps in the carriage, and Mrs. Medlock cheered up very much over her tea and chicken and beef. She ate a great deal, and afterwards fell asleep herself, and Mary sat and stared at her, and watched her fine bonnet slip on one side, until she herself fell asleep once more in the corner of the carriage, lulled by the splashing of the rain against the windows. It was quite dark when she awakened again. The train had stopped at a station, and Mrs. Medlock was shaking her. "'You have had a sleep,' she said. "'It's time to open your eyes. We're at Thwaite Station, and we've got a long drive before us.' Mary stood up and tried to keep her eyes open while Mrs. Medlock collected her parcels. The little girl did not offer to help her, because in India the servants always picked up or carried things, and it seemed quite proper that other people should wait on one. The station was a small one, and nobody but themselves seemed to be getting out of the train. The station master spoke to Mrs. Wedlock, m m sorry, Mrs. Medlock in a rough, good-natured way, pronouncing his words in a queer, broad fashion, which Mary found out afterwards was Yorkshire. "'I see thou has got back,' he said, "'and thou's brought you the young un with thee.' "'Aye, that's her,' answered Mrs. Medlock, speaking with a Yorkshire accent herself and jerking her head over her shoulder towards Mary. "'How's thy, Mrs?' "'Well, I know.' The carriage is waiting outside for thee. A brougham stood on the road before the little outside platform. Mary saw that it was a smart carriage and it was that it was a smart footman who helped her in. His long waterproof coat and the waterproof covering of his hat were shining and dripping with rain as everything was, the burly station master included. When he shut the door, mounted the box with the coachman and they drove off, the little girl found herself seated in a comfortably cushioned corner, but she was not inclined to go to sleep again. She sat and looked out of the window, curious to see something of the road over which she was being driven to the queer place Mrs. Medlock had spoken of. She was not at all a timid child, and she was not exactly frightened, but she felt that there was no knowing what might happen in a house with a hundred rooms nearly all shut up a house standing on the edge of a moor. "'What is a moor?' she said suddenly to Mrs. Medlock. "'Look out of the window in about ten minutes and you'll see,' the woman answered. "'We've got to drive five miles across Missile Moor before we get to the manor. You won't see much because it's a dark night, but you can see something.' Mary asked no more questions, but waited in the darkness of her corner, keeping her eyes on the window. The carriage lamps cast rays of light a little distance ahead of them, and she caught glimpses of the things they passed. After they had left the station, they had driven through a tiny village, and she had seen whitewashed cottages and the lights of a public house. Then they had passed a church and a vicarage, and a little shop window or so in a cottage with toys and sweets and odd things set out for sale. Then they were on the high road, and she saw hedges and trees. After that there seemed nothing different for a long time, or at least it seemed a long time to her. At last the horses began to go more slowly, as if they were climbing uphill, and presently there seemed to be no more hedges and no more trees. She could see nothing, in fact, but a dense darkness on either side. She leaned forward and pressed her face against the window, just as the carriage gave a big jolt. "'Eh, we're on the moor now, sure enough,' said Mrs. Medlock. The carriage lamps shed a yellow light on a rough-looking road which seemed to be cut through bushes and low-growing things, which ended in the great expanse of dark apparently spread out before and around them. A wind was rising and making a singular, wild, low, rushing sound. It, it's not the sea, is it? said Mary, looking round at her companion. <laughs> no, not it, answered Mrs. Medlock. Nor it isn't fields nor mountains. It's just miles and miles and miles of wild land that nothing grows on but heather and gorse and broom, and nothing lives on but wild ponies and sheep. "'I feel as if it might be the sea, if there were water on it,' said Mary. "'It sounds like the sea just now.' 
That's the wind blowing through the bushes, Mrs Medlock said. It's a wild, dreary place, uh, dreary enough place to my mind, though there's plenty that likes it, particularly when the heather's in bloom. On and on they drove through the darkness, and though the rain stopped, the wind rushed by and whistled and made strange sounds. The road went up and down, and several times the carriage passed over a little bridge beneath which water rushed very fast with a great deal of noise. Mary felt as if the drive would never come to an end, and that the wide, bleak moor was a wide expanse of black ocean through which she was passing on a strip of dry land. I don't like it, she said to herself. I don't like it. And she pinched her thin lips more tightly together. The horses were climbing up a hilly piece of road when she first caught sight of a light. Mrs Medlock saw it as soon as she did and drew a long sigh of relief. Eh, I am glad to see that bit of light twinkling, she exclaimed. It's the light in the lodge window. We shall get a good cup of tea after a bit at all events. It was after a bit, as she said, for when the carriage passed through the park gates there was still two miles of avenue to drive through, and the trees, which nearly met overhead, made it seem as if they were driving through a long, dark vault. They drove out of the vault into a clear space and stopped before an immensely long but low-built house which seemed to ramble round a stone court. At first, Mary thought that there were no lights at all in the windows, but as she got out of the carriage, she saw that one room in a corner upstairs showed a dull glow. The entrance door was a huge one, made of massive, curiously shaped panels of oak, studded with big iron nails and bound with great iron bars. It opened into an enormous hall, which was so dimly lighted that the faces in the portraits on the walls and the figures in the suits of armour made Mary feel that she did not want to look at them. As she stood on the stone floor, she looked a very small, odd little black-clad figure, and she felt as small and lost and odd as she looked. A neat, thin old man stood near the manservant who opened the door for them. You are to take her to her room, he said in a husky voice. He doesn't want to see her. He's going to London in the morning. Very well, Mr Pitcher, Mrs Medlock answered. So long as I know what's expected of me, I can manage. What's expected of you, Mrs Medlock, Mrs. Mr Pitcher said, is that you make sure that he's not disturbed and that he doesn't see what he doesn't want to see. And then Mary Lennox was led up a broad staircase and down a long corridor and up a short flight of steps and through another corridor and another until a door opened in a wall and she found herself in a room with a fire in it and a supper on a table. Mrs Medlock said unceremoniously, Well, here you are. This room and the next are where you'll live and you must keep to them. Don't you forget that. It was in this way Mistress Mary arrived at Misselthwaite Manor, and she had perhaps never felt quite so contrary in all her life. And there we shall take a break. I, uh, yes, apologies for slipping into a Yorkshire accent or slightly Yorkshire accent for Mrs. Medlock. I entirely forgot that she had that she was from that she was from up north. So, um, yes. I will attempt to keep to that, <laughs> but I forgot to start with. But yes, go have a break, go do break-related things. I hope you're enjoying it so far, and we shall see you back in about five minutes. Bye for now. Mm -hmm. 
you have all had a decent break, have uh, done the things that one does in a break, um, and yeah, I hope you're all enjoying it so far. I, I love this story, it's a good story, and yeah, Mary, Mary is not the greatest at this point. She is, she is a little brat. So, um, so yes, but, uh, hope everybody is doing all right. I have a tea. So excuse the occasional slurps that will be happening. Um, but, uh, but yes, we managed to go through, uh, okay, that's what, three chapters too bad. So we can probably... Yeah, we're... this book might take like three streams. That might be it, quite frankly. Do you know about the garden yet? Not yet. Not yet. We know that it is secret. That is, that is all we know from the title. Sam Liz. He does. He has internet. Yay. Um, spoilers. Yeah, I know. Uh, yes, Sam, Sam now has internet, although uh, apparently just on Wi-Fi at the moment, so fingers crossed that improves. There's a garden? I know, right? Madness. And yes, I yeah, I apologise for, um, yeah, realising that Mrs. Medlock is northern <laughs> halfway through, so the accent just gradually got more northern, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's fine. Uh, but yes, um, if everybody is sitting comfortably, shall we continue? I think we shall. Don't, don't, I don't need to read any more. Sam finished the story for us. Damn it, Sam. You ruined it. How could you? <sighs> Awful. Well, we're going to carry on reading anyway. Because we got to... Right. Chapter 4. Martha. When she opened her eyes in the morning, it was because a young housemaid had come into her room to light the fire and was kneeling on the hearth rug, raking out the cinders noisily. Mary lay and watched her for a few moments and then began to look about the room. She had never seen a room at all like it and she thought it curious and gloomy. The walls were covered with tapestry with a forest scene embroidered on it there were fantastically dressed people under the trees, and in the distance there was a glimpse of the turrets of a castle. There were hunters and horses and dogs and ladies. Mary felt as if she were in the forest with them. Out of a deep window she could see a great climbing stretch of land, which seemed to have no trees on it, and to look rather like an endless, dull, purplish sea. What is that? she said, pointing out of the window. Martha, the young housemaid who had just risen to her feet, looked and pointed also. That there, she said. Yes, that's the moor, with a good-natured grin. Does thou like it? No, answered Mary. I hate it. That's because thou'rt not used to it, Martha said, going back to her hearth. Thou thinks it's too big and bare now, but thou will like it. Do you? inquired Mary. Aye, that I do, answered Martha, cheerfully polishing away at the grate. I just love it. It's none bare. It's covered with growing things as smells sweet. It's fair lovely in spring and summer when the gorse and broom and heather's in flower. It smells of honey, and there's been such a lot of, uh, sorry, and there's such a lot of fresh air. And the sky looks so high, and the bees and skylarks make such a nice noise humming and singing. Eh, I wouldn't a live away from the moor for anything. Mary listened to her with a grave, puzzled expression. The native servants she had been used to in India were not in the least like this. They were obsequious and servile, and did not presume to talk to their masters as if they were their equals. They made salams and called them protector of the poor and names of that sort. Indian servants were commanded to do things, not asked. It was not the custom to say please and thank you, and Mary had always slapped her ire in the face when she was angry. 
She wondered a little what this girl would do if one slapped her in the face. She was a round, rosy, good-natured looking creature, but she had a sturdy way which made Mistress Mary wonder if she might not even slap back, if the person, even if the person who slapped her was only a little girl. You are a strange servant, she said from her pillows, rather haughtily. Martha sat up on her heels, with her blacking brush in her hand, and laughed without seeming the least out of temper. <laughs> eh, and all that, she said. If there was a grand missus at Misselthwaite, I should never be, never have even been one of the underhousemaids. I might have been led to be scullery maid, but I've never been let upstairs. I'm too common, and I talk too much Yorkshire. But this is a funny house for all it's so grand. Seems like there's neither master nor mistress except Mr Pitcher and Mrs Medlock. Mr Craven, he won't be troubled about anything when he's here, and he's nearly always away. Mrs Medlock gave me the place out of kindness. She told me she could never have done it if Misselthwaite had been like other big houses. Are you going to be my servant? Mary asked, still in her imperious little Indian way. Martha began to rub the grate again. I'm Mrs Medlock's servant, she said stoutly, and she's Mr Craven's, but I'm to do all the housemaid's work up here and wait on you a bit, but you won't need much waiting on. Who is going to dress me? demanded Mary. Martha sat up on her heels again and stared. She spoke in broad Yorkshire in her amazement. Can I address thy sin? she said. What do you mean? I can't understand your language, said Mary. Eh, I forgot, Martha said. Mrs Medlock told me I'd have to be careful or you wouldn't know what I was saying. I mean, can't you put on your own clothes? No, answered Mary quite indignantly. I never did in my life. My eye addressed me, of course. Well, said Martha, Martha evidently not in the least aware that she was impudent. It's time that I should learn. I cannot begin younger. It'll do thee good to wait on thy sen a bit. My mother always said she couldn't see why grand people's children didn't turn out fair fools, what with nurses and being washed and dressed and took out to walk as if they were puppies. It is different in India, said Mistress Mary disdainfully. She, she, she could scarcely stand this. But Martha was not at all crushed. Eh, I can see it's different, she answered almost sympathetically. I dare say it's because there's such a lot of other people there instead of respectable white people. When I heard you was coming from India, I thought you were black too. Mary sat up in bed, furious. What? she said. What? You thought I was a native? You, you daughter of a pig. Martha stared and looked hot. Will you call her names? she said. You needn't be so vexed. That's not the way for a young lady to talk. I've nothing against the natives. When you read about them in tracts, they're always very religious. You always read as a black man's a man and a brother. I've never seen one, and I was fair pleased to think I was going to see one close. When I come in to light your fire this morning, I crept up to your bed and pulled back the cupboard, careful to look at you. And there you was, disappointedly. No more black than me. For all you're so yeller. Mary did not even try to crawl, control her rage and humiliation. You thought I was a native? You dared? You don't know anything about natives. They are not people. They are servants who must salam to you. You know nothing about India. You know nothing about anything. She was in such a rage and felt so hopeless before the girl's simple stare and somehow she suddenly felt so horribly lonely and far away from everything she understood and which understood her that she threw herself face downward on the pillows and burst into passionate sobbing. She sobbed so unrestrainedly that good-natured Yorkshire Martha was a bit frightened and quite sorry for her. She went to the bed and bent over her. Eh, hey, you mustn't cry like that there, she begged. You mustn't for sure. I didn't know you'd be vexed. I don't know anything about anything, just like you said. I beg your pardon, miss. Do stop crying. 
There was something comforting and really friendly in her queer Yorkshire speech and sturdy way, which had a good effect on Mary. She gradually ceased crying and became quiet. Martha looked relieved. It's time for thee to get up now, she said. Mrs Medlock said I was to carry thy breakfast and tea and dinner into the room next to this. It's been made into a nursery for thee. I'll help thee on with thy clothes if thou'll get out of bed. If the buttons are at the back, thou cannot button them up thyself. When Mary at last decided to get up, the clothes Martha took from the wardrobe were not the ones she had worn when she arrived the night before with Mrs Medlock. Those are not mine, she said. Mine are black. She looked at the thick white wool coat and dress over and added with cool approval, Those are nicer than mine. These are the ones thou must put on, Martha answered. Mr Craven ordered Mrs Medlock to get them in London. He said, I won't have a child dressed in black wandering about like a lost soul. He said, it made the place sadder than it is. Put colour on her. Mother, mother, she said she knew what he meant. Mother always knows what a body means. She doesn't hold with black herself. I hate black things, said Mary. The dressing process was one which taught them both something. Martha had buttoned up her little sisters and brothers, but she had never seen a child who stood still and waited for another person to do things for her as if she had ne neither hands nor feet of her own. Why doesn't thou put on their own shoes? She said when Mary quietly held out her foot. My ayah did it, answered Mary, staring. It was the custom. She said that very often. It was the custom. The native servants were always saying it. If one told them to do a thing their ancestors had not done for a thousand years, they gazed at one mildly and said, It is not the custom and one knew that was the end of the matter. It had not been the custom that Mistress Mary should do anything but stand and allow, allow herself to be dressed like a doll, but before she was ready for breakfast she began to suspect that her life at Misselthwaite Manor would end by teaching her a number of things quite new to her, things such as putting on her own shoes and stockings and picking up things she let fall. If Martha had been a well-trained, fine young lady's maid, she would have been more subservient and respectful, and would have known that it was her business to brush hair and button boots and pick things up and lay them away. She was, however, only an untrained Yorkshire rustic who had been brought up in a moorland cottage with a swarm of little brothers and sisters, and who had never dreamed of doing anything but waiting on themselves and on the younger ones who were either babies in arms or just learning to totter about and tumble over things. If Mary Lennox had been a child who was ready to be amused, she would perhaps have laughed at Martha's readiness to talk, but Mary only listened to her coldly and wondered at her freedom of manner. At first she was not at all interested, but gradually, as the girl rattled on in her good-tempered, homely way, Mary began to notice what she was saying. Eh, you should see them all, she said. There's twelve of us, and my father only gets sixteen shillings a week. I can tell you my mother's put it to get porridge for them all. Put to it to get porridge for them all. They tumble about on the moor and play there all day, and mother says they're of the moor fattens them. She says she believes they eat the grass same as the wild ponies do. Ah, Dickon, he's twelve years old, and he's got a young pony he calls his own. Where did he get it? asked Mary. He found it on the moor with its mother when it was a little one, and he began to make friends with it and give it bits of bread and pluck young grass for it. And it got to like him, so it follows him about and it lets him, on get, it lets him get on its back. Dickon's a kind lad, and animals like him. Mary had never possessed an animal pet of her own, and had always thought she should like one. So she began to feel a slight interest in Dickon, and as she had never been interested in anyone but herself, it was the dawning of a healthy sentiment. When she went into the room which had been made into a nursery for her, she found that it was rather like the one she had slept in. It was not a child's room, but a grown-up person's room, with gloomy old pictures on the walls and heavy, oak, heavy old oak chairs. 
A table in the centre was set with a good substantial breakfast. But she had always had a very small appetite, and she looked with something more than indifference at the first plate Martha set before her. I don't want it, she said. Thou doesn't want thy porridge, Martha exclaimed incredulously. No, thou doesn't know how good it is. Put a bit of treacle on it or a bit of sugar. I don't want it, repeated Mary. Eh, said Martha, I can't abide to see good victuals go to waste. If our children was at this table, they'd clean it bare in five minutes. Why? asked Mary coldly. Why? echoed Martha. Because they scarce ever had their stomachs full in all their lives. They're as hungry as young hawks and foxes. I don't know what it is to be hungry, said Mary, with the indifference of ignorance. Martha looked indignant. Well, it would do thee good to try it. I can see that plain enough, she said outspokenly. I've no patience with folks and sits and just stares at good bread and meat. My word, don't I wish Dickon and Phil and Jane and the... Excuse me, and the rest of them had... had sorry, and the rest of them had what's here under their pinafores. Why don't you take it to them? suggested Mary. It's not mine, answered Martha stoutly. And this... Excuse me. And this isn't my day out. I get my day out once a month, same as the rest. Then I go home and clean up for mother and give her a day's rest. Mary drank some tea and ate a little toast and some marmalade. You wrap up warm and run out and play, you, said Martha. It'll do you good and give you some stomach for your meat. Mary went to the window. There were gardens and paths and big trees, but everything looked dull and wintry. Out? Why should I go out on a day like this? Well, if thou doesn't go out, thou'll have to stay in. And what has that got to do? Mary glanced about her. There was nothing to do. When Mrs Medlock had prepared the nursery, she had not thought of amusement. Perhaps it would be better to go and see what the gardens were like. Who will go with me? She inquired. Martha stared. You'll go by yourself, she answered. You'll have to learn to play like the other children does when they haven't got sisters and brothers. Ah, Dickon goes off on the moor by himself and plays for hours. That's how he made friends with the pony. He's got sheep on the moor that knows him, and birds as comes and eats, and out, uh, eats out of his hand. However little there is to eat, he always saves a bit of bread to coax his pets. It was really this mention of Dickon which made Mary decide to go out, though she was not aware of it. There would be birds outside, though there would not be ponies or sheep. They would be different from the birds in India, and it might amuse her to look at them. Martha found her coat and hat for her, and a pair of stout little boots, and she showed her the way she showed her, her way downstairs. If thou goes round that way, thou'll come to the gardens, she said, pointing to a gate in a wall of shrubbery. There's lots of flowers in summer time, but there's nothing blooming now. She seemed to hesitate a second before she added, One of the gardens is locked up. No one has been in it for ten years. Why? asked Mary in spite of herself. Here was another locked door that added to the hundred in the strange house. Mr Craven had it shut when his wife died so sudden. He won't let no one go inside. It was her garden. He locked the door and dug an hole and buried the key. Oh, there's Mrs ben Medlock's bell ringing. I must run. After she was gone, Mary turned down the walk which led to the door in the shrubbery. She could not help thinking about the garden which no one had been into for ten years. She wondered what it would look like and whether there were any flowers still alive in it. When she had passed through the shrubbery gate, she found herself in great gardens, with wide lawns and winding walks with clipped borders. There were trees and flower beds and evergreens clipped into strange shapes, and a large pool with an old grey fountain in its midst. But the flower beds were bare and wintry, 
and the fountain was not playing. This was not the garden which was shut up. How could a garden be shut up? You could always walk into a garden. She was just thinking this when she saw that, at the end of the path she was following, there seemed to be a long wall with ivy growing over it. She was not familiar enough with England to know that she was coming upon the kitchen gardens where the vegetables and fruit were growing. She went towards the wall and found that there was a, a green door in the ivy and that it stood open. This was not the closed garden, evidently, and she could go into it. She went through the door and found that it was a garden with walls all around it and that, was, that it was only one of several walled gardens which seemed to open into one another. She saw another open green door, revealing bushes and pathways between beds containing winter vegetables. Fruit trees were trained flat against the wall, and over some of the beds there were glass frames. The place was bare and ugly enough, Mary thought, as she stood and stared about her. It might be nicer in summer, when things were green, but there was nothing pretty about it now. Presently an old man with a spade over his shoulder walked through the door leading from the second garden. He looked startled when he saw Mary, and then touched his cap. He had a surly old face, and did not seem at all pleased to see her, but then she was displeased with his garden, and wore her quite contrary expression, and certainly did not seem at all pleased to see him. "'What is this place?' she asked. "'One of the kitchen gardens,' he answered. "'What is that?' said Mary, pointing through the other green door. "'Another of them, shortly. "'There's another on t'other side of the wall, and there's the orchard t'other side of that.' "'Can I go in them?' asked Mary. "'If thou likes, but there's naught to see.' Mary made no response. She went down the path and through the second green door. There she found more walls and winter vegetables and glass frames, but in the second wall there was another green door, and it was not open. Perhaps it led into the garden which no one had seen for ten years. As she was not at all a timid child, and always did what she wanted to do, Mary went to the green door and turned the handle. She hoped the door would not open, because she wanted to be sure she had found the mysterious garden. But it did open quite easily, and she walked through it and found herself in an orchard. There were walls all around it also, and trees trained against them, and there were bare fruit trees growing in the winter browned grass. But there was no green door to be seen anywhere. Mary looked for it. And yet, when she had entered the upper end of the garden, she had noticed that the wall did not seem to end with the orchard, but to extend beyond it, as if it enclosed a place at the other side. She could see the tops of trees above the wall, and when she stood still, she saw a bird with a bright red breast sitting on the topmost branch of one of them, and suddenly he burst into his winter song, almost as if he had caught sight of her and was calling to her. She stopped and listened to him, and somehow his cheerful, friendly little whistle gave her a pleased feeling. Even a disagreeable little girl may be lonely, and the big closed house and big bare moor and big bare gardens had made this one feel as if there was no one left in the world but herself. If she had been an affectionate child who had been used to being loved, she would have broken her heart. But even though she was Mistress Mary quite contrary, she was desolate, and the bright-breasted little bird brought a look into her sour little face which was almost a smile. She listened to him until he flew away. He was not like an Indian bird, and she liked him and wondered if she should ever see him again. Perhaps he lived in the mysterious garden and knew all about it. Perhaps it was because she had nothing whatever to do that she thought so much of the deserted garden. She was curious about it, and wanted to see what it was like. Why had Mr Archibald Craven buried the key? If he had liked his wife so much, why did he hate her garden? She wondered if she should ever see him, 
but she she knew that if she sorry she knew that if she did she should not like him and he would not like her and that she should only stand and stare at him and say nothing though she should be wanting dreadfully to ask him why he had done such a queer thing people never like me and i never like people she thought and i can never and i never can talk as the crawford children could they were always talking and laughing and making noises. She thought of the robin and of the way he seemed to sing his song at her, and as she remembered the treetop he perched on, she stopped rather suddenly on the path. I believe that tree was in the secret garden. I feel sure it was, she said. There was a wall round the place and there was no door. She walked back to the first kitchen garden she had entered and found the old man digging there. She went and stood beside him and watched him a few moments in her cold little way. He took no notice of her, and so at last she spoke to him. "'I have been into the other gardens,' she said. "'There was nothing to prevent thee,' he answered crustily. "'I went into the orchard. "'There was no dog at the door to bite thee.' he answered. There was no door there into the other garden, said Mary. What garden? he said in a rough voice, stopping his digging for a moment. The one on the other side of the wall, answered Mistress Mary. There were trees there. I saw the tops of them. A bird with a red breast was sitting on one of them, and he sang. To her surprise, the surly old weather-beaten face actually changed its expression. A slow smile spread over it, and the gardener looked quite different. It made her think that it was curious how much nicer a person looked when he smiled. She had not thought of it before. He turned about to the orchard side of his garden and began to whistle, a low, soft whistle. She could not understand how such a surly man could make such a coaxing sound. Almost the next moment, a wonderful thing happened. She heard a soft little rushing flight through the air, and it was the bird with the red breast flying to them, and he actually alighted on the big clod of earth quite near to the gardener's foot. Here he is, chuckled the old man, and then he spoke to the bird as if he was speaking to a child. "'Where has thou been, that cheeky little beggar?' he said. "'I've not seen thee before to-day. "'Has thou, been that, has, has thou begun the courting this early in the season? "'That too forward. "'The bird put his tiny head on one side "'and looked up at him with his soft, bright eye, "'which was like, black, which was like a black dewdrop. "'He seemed quite familiar and not the least afraid. "'He hopped about and pecked the earth briskly, looking for seeds and insects. It actually gave Mary a queer feeling in her heart, because he was so pretty and cheerful and seemed so like a person. He had a tiny plump body and a delicate beak and slender delicate legs. Will he always come when you call him? She asked, almost in a whisper. Aye, that he will. I've gnawed him ever since he was a fledgling. He come out of the nest in the other garden, and when he first flew over the wall he was too weak to fly back for a few days, and we got friendly. When he went over the wall again the rest of the brood was gone, and he was lonely, and he come back to me. What kind of a bird is he? Mary asked. Doesn't thou know? He's a robin redbreast, and they're the friendliest, curiousest birds alive. They're almost as friendly as dogs, if you know how to get on with them. Watch him pecking about there and looking round at us now and again. He knows we're talking about him. It was the queerest thing in the world to see the old fellow. He looked at the plump little scarlet waistcoated bird as if he were both proud and fond of him. He's a conceited one, he chuckled. He likes to hear folk talk about him. Sorry, he likes to hear folk talk about him. And curious, bless me, there never was his like for curiosity and meddling. He's always coming to see what I'm planting. He knows all the things Mr Craven never troubles himself to find out. He's the head gardener, he is. 
the robin hopped about, busily pecking the soil, and now and again, now and then, stopped and looked at them a little. Mary thought his black dewdrop eyes gazed at her with great curiosity. It really seemed as if he were finding out all about her. The queer feeling in her heart increased. Where did the rest of the brood fly to? She asked. There's no knowing. The old ones turn them out of their nest and make them fly, and they're scattered before you know it. This one was a knowing one, and he knew he was lonely. Mistress Mary went a step nearer to the robin and looked at him very hard. I'm lonely, she said. She had not known before that this was one of the things which made her feel sour and cross. She seemed to find it out when the robin looked at her and she looked at the robin. The old gardener pushed his cap back on his bald head and stared at her a minute. Art thou the little wench from India? he asked. Mary nodded. Then no wonder thou'rt lonely. Thou'lt be lonelier before thou's done, he said. He began to dig again, driving his spade deep into the rich black garden soil, while the robin hopped about, very busily employed. What's your name? Mary inquired. He stood up to answer her. Ben Weatherstaff, he answered, and then he added with a surly chuckle, I'm lonely myself, except when he's with me. And he jerked his thumb towards the robin. He's the only friend I've got. I have no friends at all, said Mary. I never had. My ayah didn't like me, and I never played with anyone. It is a Yorkshire habit to say what you think with blunt frankness, and old Ben Weatherstaff was a Yorkshire moor man. Thou and me are good bit alike, he said. We was wove out of the same cloth. We're neither of us good looking, and we're both of us as sour as we look. We've got the same nasty tempers, nasty tempers, both of us, I'll warrant. This was plain speaking, and Mary Lennox had never heard the truth about herself in her life. The servants always salamed and submitted to you, whatever you did. She had never thought much about her looks, but she wondered if she was as unattractive as Ben Weatherstaff, and she also wondered if she looked as sour as he had looked before the robin came. She actually began to wonder also if she was nasty-tempered. She felt uncomfortable. Suddenly a clear, rippling little sound broke out near her, and she turned around. She was standing a few feet from a young apple tree, and the robin had flown onto one of its branches and had burst out into a scrap of song. Ben Weatherstaff laughed outright. What did he do that for? asked Mary. He's made up his mind to make friends with thee, replied Ben. Dang me if he hasn't took a fancy to thee. To me? said Mary, and she moved towards the little tree softly and looked up. Would you make friends with me? she said to the robin, just as if she were speaking to a person. Would you? And she did not say it either in her hard little voice or in her imperious Indian voice, but in a tone so soft and eager and coaxing that Ben Weatherstaff was... A excuse me. Ben Weatherstaff was as surprised as she had been when she heard him whistle. Why? he cried out. Thou said that as nice and human as if thou was a real child instead of a sharp old woman. I said it almost like Dickon talks to his wild things out on the moor. Do you know Dickon? Mary asked, turning round rather in a hurry. Everybody knows him. Dickon's wandering about everywhere. The very blackberries and heather bells knows him. I warrant the foxes shows him where their cubs lies and the skylarks don't hide, doesn't hide their nests from him. Mary would have liked to ask some more questions. She was almost as curious about Dickon as she was about the deserted garden. But just, as that mo at the, just at that moment, the robin, who had ended his song, gave a little shake of his wings, spread them, and flew away. He had made his visit and had other things to do. He has flown over the wall, Mary cried out, watching him. He has flown into the orchard. He has flown across the other wall into the garden where there is no door. He lives there, 
said old Ben. He came out of egg there. If he's courting, he's making up to some young madam of a robin that lives among the old rose trees there. Rose trees? said Mary. Are there rose trees? Ben Weatherstaff took up his spade again and began to dig. There was ten year ago, he mumbled. I should like to see them, said Mary. Where is the green door? There must be a door somewhere. Ben drove his spade deep and looked as uncompanionable as he had looked when she first saw him. There was ten year ago, but there isn't now, he said. No door, cried Mary. There must be. None as anyone can find and none as it's anyone's business. Don't be a meddlesome wench and put your nose where it's no cause to go. Here, I must go on with my work. Go on with my work. Get you gone and play, you. I've no more time. And he actually stopped digging, threw his spade over his shoulder, and walked off without even glancing at her or saying goodbye. Chapter 5 The Cry in the Corridor at first, each day which passed by for Mary Lennox was exactly like the others. Every morning she awoke in her tapestried room and found Martha kneeling upon the hearth building her fire. Every morning she ate her breakfast in the nursery, which had nothing amusing in it, and after each breakfast she gazed out of the window across to the huge moor, which seemed to spread out on all sides and climb up to the sky. And after she had stared for a while, she realised that if she did not go out, she would have to stay in and do nothing. And so she went out. She did not know that this was the best thing she could have done, and she did not know that when she w began to walk quickly or even run along the paths and down the avenue, she was stirring her slow blood and making herself stronger by fighting with the wind which swept down from the moor. She ran only to make herself warm, and she hated the wind which rushed at her face and roared and held her back as if it were some giant she could not see. But the big breaths of rough, rough fresh air blown over the heather filled her lungs with something which was good for her. Sorry. Something which was good for her whole thin body and whipped some red colour and... Excuse me. Uh, some red colour into her cheeks and brightened her dull eyes when she did not know anything about it. But, after a few days spent almost entirely out of doors, she wakened one morning, knowing what it was to be hungry, and when she sat down to her breakfast she did not glance disdainfully at her porridge and push it away, but took up her spoon and began to eat it, and went on eating it until her bowl was empty. "'I got on well enough with that this morning, didn't they?' said Martha. "'It tastes nice today.' said Mary, feeling a little surprised herself. "'It's there of the moor that's giving thee stomach for thy victuals,' answered Martha. "'It's lucky for thee that thou's got victuals as well as an appetite. "'There's been twelve in our cottage as had the stomach and nothing to put in it. "'You go on playing you out of doors every day and you'll get some flesh on your bones "'and you won't be so yellow.' "'I don't play,' said Mary. "'I have nothing to play with.' "'Nothing to play with?' exclaimed Martha. Our children plays with sticks and stones. Just runs about and shouts and looks at things. Mary did not shout, but she looked at things. There was nothing else to do. She walked round and round the gardens and wondered about the paths in the park. Sometimes she looked for Ben Weatherstaff, but though several times she saw him at work, he was too busy to look at her or was too surly. Once, when she was walking towards him, he picked up his spade and turned away as if he did it on purpose. One place she went to oftener than any other. It was the long walk outside the gardens with the walls round them. There were bare flower beds on either side of it, and against the walls ivy grew thickly. <clears throat> there was one part of the wall... Excuse me. <clears throat> There was one part of ugh, one part of the wall where the creeping dark green leaves were more bushy than elsewhere. It seemed as if for a long time that part had been neglected. 
The rest of it had been clipped and made to look neat, but at this lower end of the walk it had not been trimmed at all. A few days after she had talked to Ben Weatherstaff, Mary stopped to notice this and wondered why it was so. She had just paused and was looking up at a long spray of ivy swinging in the wind when she saw a gleam of scarlet and heard a brilliant chirp and there, on the top of the wall, perched Ben Weatherstaff's robin redbreast, tilting forward to look at her with his small head on one side. Oh! she cried out. Is it you? Is it you? And it did not seem at all queer to her that she spoke to him as if she was sure that he would understand and answer her. He did answer. He twittered and chirped and hopped along the wall as if he were telling her all sorts of things. It seemed to Mistress Mary as if she understood him too, though he was not speaking in words. It was as if he said, Good morning, isn't the wind nice, isn't the sun nice, isn't everything nice? Let us both chirp and hop and twitter. Come on, come on. Mary began to laugh, and as he hopped and took little flights along the wall, she ran after him. Poor little thin, sallow, ugly Mary. She actually looked almost pretty for a moment. I like you, I like you, she cried out, pattering down the walk, and she chirped and tried to whistle, which last she did not know how to not know how to do in the least. But the robin seemed to be quite satisfied, and chirped and whistled back at her. At last he spread his wings and made a darting flight to the top of the tree, a, a tree where he perched and sang loudly. That reminded Mary of the first time she had seen him. He had been swinging, swinging on a treetop then, and she had been standing in the orchard. Now she was on the other side of the orchard and standing in the path outside a wall, much lower down, and there was the same tree inside. It's in the garden no one can go into, she said to herself. It's the garden without a door. He lives in there. How I wish I could see what it is like. She ran up the walk to the green door she had entered the first morning. Then she ran down the path through the other door and then into the orchard. And when she stood and looked up there, up, looked up, there was the tree on the other side of the wall and there was the robin just finishing his song and beginning to preen his feathers with his beak. It is the garden, she said. I am sure it is. She walked round and looked closely at that side of the orchard wall but she only found what she had found before, that there was no door in it. Then she ran through the kitchen gardens again and out into the walk outside the long ivy-covered wall and she walked to the end of it and looked at it, but there was no door. And then she walked to the other end, looking again, but there was no door. It's very queer, she said. Ben Weatherstaff said there was no door and there is no door. But there must have been one ten years ago, because Mr Craven buried the key. This gave her so much to think of that she began to be quite interested and feel that she was not sorry that she had come to Misselthwaite Manor. In India she had always felt hot and too languid to care much about anything. The fact was that the fresh wind from the moor had begun to blow the cobwebs out of her young brain and awaken her up a little. She stayed out of doors nearly all day, and when she sat down to her supper at night, she felt hungry and drowsy and comfortable. She did not feel cross when Martha chattered away. She felt as if she rather liked to hear her, and at last she thought she would ask her a question. She asked it after she had finished her supper and had sat down on the hearthrug before the fire. Why did Mr Craven hate the garden? She said. She had made Martha stay with her, and Martha had not objected at all. She was very young, and used to a crowded cottage full of brothers and sisters, and she found it dull in the great servants' hall downstairs, where the footmen and the upper housemaids made fun of her Yorkshire speech, and looked upon her as a common little thing, and sat and whispered among themselves. Martha liked to talk and the strange child who had lived in India and been waited upon by natives was novelty enough to attract her. She sat down on the hearth herself without waiting to be asked. Art thou thinking about that garden yet? She said, I knew thou would, 
It was just the way that was just the way with me when I first heard about it. Why did he hate it? Mary persisted. Martha tucked her feet under her and made herself quite comfortable. Listen to the wind wuthering about the house, she said. You could bear stand up on the moor if you was out on it tonight. Mary did not, not did not know what wuthering meant until she listened, and then she understood. It must mean that hollow, shuddering sort of roar which rushed round and round the house, as if the giant no one could see were buffeting it and beating at the walls and windows to try and break in. But one knew he could not get in, and somehow it made one feel very safe and warm inside a room with a red coal fire. But why did he hate it so? she asked after she had listened. She intended to know if Martha did. Then Martha gave up, gave up her store of knowledge. Mind, she said, Mrs. Medlock says it's not to be talked about. There's lots of things in this place that's not to be talked over. That's Mr. Craven's orders. His troubles are more uh, are none of servants' business, he says. But for the garden, he wouldn't be like he is. It was Mrs. Craven's garden that she had made when they f when first they were married, and she just loved it. And they used to tend the flowers themselves and none of the gardeners was ever let to go in. Him and her used to go in and shut the door and stay there hours and hours, reading and talking. And she was just a bit of a girl, and there was an old tree with a branch bent like, bench, branch bent like a seat on it, and she made roses grow over it, and she used to sit there. But one day, when she was sitting there, the branch broke, and she fell on the ground and was hurt so bad that the next day she died. The doctors thought he'd go out of his mind and die too. That's why he hates it. No one's ever gone in since, and he won't let anyone talk about it. Mary did not ask any more questions. She looked at the fire and listened to the wind wuthering. It seemed to be wuthering louder than ever. At that moment, a very good thing was happening to her. Four good things had happened to her, in fact, since she came to Misselthwaite Manor. She had felt as if she had understood a robin, and that he had understood her. She had run in the wind until her blood had grown warm. She had been healthily hungry for the first time in her life, and she had found out what it was to be sorry for someone. She was getting on. But as she was listening to the wind, she began to listen to something else. She did not know what it was, because at first she could scarcely distinguish it from the wind itself. It was a curious sound. It seemed almost as if a child were crying somewhere. Sometimes the wind sounded rather like a child crying, but presently Mistress Mary felt quite sure that this sound was inside the house, not outside it. It was far away, but it was inside. She turned round and looked at Martha. Do you hear anyone crying? she said. Martha suddenly looked confused. No, she answered, it's the wind. Sometimes it sounds as if someone was lost on the moor and wailing. It's got all sorts of sounds. But, but listen, said Mary, it's in the house, down one of those long corridors. And at that, mo that very moment a door must have been opened somewhere downstairs for a great rushing draught blew along the passage, and the door of the room they sat in was blown open with a crash, and as they both jumped to their feet the light was blown out, and the crying sound was swept down the far corridor, so that it was to be heard more plainly than ever. There, said Mary, I told you so. It is someone crying, and it isn't a grown-up person. Martha ran and shut the door and turned the key, but before she did it, they both, heard the so they both heard the sound of a door in some far passage, shutting with a bang. And then everything was quiet, for even the wind ceased wuthering for a few moments. It was the wind, said Martha stubbornly. And if it wasn't, it was little Betty Butterworth, a scullery maid. She'd had, she's had the toothache all day. But something troubled and awkward in her manner made Mistress Mary stare very hard at her. She did not believe she was speaking the truth. 
And I think there we shall end it for tonight. <laughs>